All right, good morning. Good morning. Let me say Happy New Year. Um, uh, if you would turn in your Bible to the book of Galatians, chapter 5. And um, if you don't have a smartphone or don't have a Bible, and if you'd like one, we have some Bibles on the back bookshelf. You're welcome to grab one of those. And if you don't own a Bible, uh, you're welcome to keep it. Um, <clears throat> we've been going through the book of Galatians uh, for several months now, and we're in Galatians chapter 5. This morning we're going to be in verses 19 to 21, and then 24 and 26. Uh, the title of the sermon is The Works of the Flesh. And let me, uh, if you're visiting with us this morning, let me uh, assure you, we don't, I don't normally preach on, you know, the works of the flesh. That, that just happens to be where we're at in the text uh, this morning. We, we go through it verse by verse, and that's how we, uh, I preach at this church, is going through books of the Bible and preaching verse by verse, and that's where we are this morning. So um, it is all the Word of God. It's all profitable for teaching and reproof and correction. So uh, we're looking at works of the flesh this morning. Uh, this will be a two-part series so um, let's read the text. I'll open us in a word of prayer, and then we'll jump into the sermon this morning. Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 19. It's what Paul writes. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these, I warn you as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then down in verse 24, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And in verse 26, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Let's pray. Lord, I ask that you help us as a church, Lord, to wrestle with um, these works of the flesh and our understanding of them and, and what they um, mean and what they identify as and, and God, would you help us as we continue to go through this book to walk by the Spirit, to not walk by the flesh, but to walk by your good Spirit that you've given us. God, we desire to, to do that, and we need your help to do it. So we, we ask, God, that you would please be gracious to us now and help us to understand the works of the flesh so that we can better... Um, know what we are fighting against, and identify them in our heart. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The sermon this morning and next week will be a two-week series. Um, the reason it's two weeks is that in verses 19 to 21, Paul lists a total of 15 works of the flesh. And, you know, I, rather than just gloss over that and just move on, or rather than break that up. I you know, didn't want to do three or four sermons on it, and I didn't want to do just one because I thought that would be too much. We're going to do it over two weeks. And so what I've done is I've divided these 15 works of the flesh into four categories. And here they are. Category one is the sins of immorality. There's three of them. Sexual immorality, impurity, and sensuality. Category two is the sins of idolatry, which is simply idolatry and then sorcery. Category three is the sins of relationship. There's eight of those. Enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, rivalry, dissensions, divisions, and envy. And category four is the sins of intemperance, which is two of those, drunkenness and orgies. Today, we're going to look at categories one, two, and four. So we'll have a total of seven works of the flesh, and next week, we'll look at category three, just category three, which is the category of relationship, because there's a total of eight. So seven today, eight next week. And the way that I'm going to structure each sermon today and next week is this. I'm going to start off and give you guys some theological foundations. Theological foundations, things to keep in mind while we work through this. Then we're going to look at the works of the flesh. We'll look at each of those individually. 
and then we'll talk about walking in the Spirit. So that's the structure. We're going to talk about theological foundations. That when we go through these works of the flesh, what should you be keeping in mind? What, what theology should be in your mind as we work through this? Then the works of the flesh, what are they? And why are they a work of the flesh? And then walking in the Spirit. We're going to talk about how and why walking in the Spirit enables us to not gratify the works of the flesh. That's where we're going. So let's start off with theological foundations. I have four this morning and four next week. Theological foundations, four this morning. Number one, works of the flesh are evident. Works of the flesh are evident. Where do I get this from? Look at verse 19. Uh, Paul writes, now the works of the flesh are evident. <laughs> Says it right there. Well, what does Paul mean by that? What does he mean that they're evident? That word evident there, most translations translate as obvious. Most translations say the works of the flesh are obvious. I think Paul is trying to say to the church at Galatia, listen guys, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. We all know that there's a, a right and a wrong. Everybody knows that there's such a thing as a right and a wrong. Paul explicitly explains this in Romans 1 and 2. Paul writes in Romans 2.15, the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness. John Piper, who's a, a theologian, a writer, and pastor, he writes, guilt is a universal experience. Everybody at some time or other has had the bad feeling of not doing what they ought to have done. Even people who deny that there's such a thing as right and wrong, and there are people who deny that, they are trapped by the law of God written on their hearts. They set out to prove that there's no such thing as right and wrong, and that all ethics are relative. They're all arbitrary, but they wind up saying that it's right for you to agree with them and wrong for you not to. So, Paul is saying, look, the works of the flesh are evident. They are obvious. So I want to be clear that this list that we're going through today and next week, this is not Paul's personal pet peeves. This is not just some man named Paul 2,000 years ago who just had a bunch of personal pet peeves that he didn't like. No, this is not a cultural list of do's and don'ts. This is not something cultural to the Hebrews or the, uh, the Greeks or Jews. This, this is God's list. This is God's list of the works of the flesh, and they are obvious. They are evident. They are timeless. To anybody that they are not obvious, the reason for that, it is a byproduct of our unrighteousness suppressing the truth. That's what Paul writes in Romans, that our unrighteousness can suppress the truth. That's number one. Number two, theological foundation. Galatians 5, 19 to 21 is not an exhaustive list. It's not an exhaustive list of works of the flesh. How do we know that? We know that for two reasons. A, the phrase in verse 21. Look at verse 21 here. He says, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now look at that phrase there when he says things like these. Things like these, meaning there are more things like these. There are more things like these. B, there are other lists given in Scripture that include more works of the flesh. For instance, covetousness. Covetousness doesn't occur in this list, but it occurs in Ephesians 5.3. Passion, evil desire, covetousness, Colossians 3.5. Selfish ambition, James 3.14. Murder, adultery, theft, False witness, slander, Matthew 15, 19. So what's the point of making, why highlight this, Matt? The reason I think it's important is because if we are ever just looking at one verse of the Bible or just one list of the Bible, we might get the impression, well, I'm doing pretty good. I'm not a murderer. I'm not out there stealing and raping and murdering and selling drugs. That may very well be true. But idolatry is as much a work of the flesh as murder is. Divisions are as much a work of the flesh as adultery is. We must keep that in mind. 
3. Works of the flesh do not define and identify Christians, but the lost world. This list does not define and identify Christians, but the lost world. Another way to say this is that works of the flesh and fruit of the Spirit, they're not two equal lists. The battle between good and evil is not equal in the heart of a lost person, and it's not equal in the heart of a Christian. You know that, that, that age-old cartoon where there's like an angel on one side and a little demon on, devil on the other side, and they kind of both whisper to you and tell you, and it's like there's equal voices? That's not true. That's not true for the lost person. That's not true for the Christian. It doesn't work that way. The list of works of the flesh define and identify the lost person. When we are lost, and all of us in this room at one point or another, we're lost at one point. When we are lost and in our unregenerate state, we are completely controlled by our passions and desires. And ev any evidence of the fruit of the Spirit, when people say, well, I see people out there all the time being patient and kind and good. Yes, and it's the common grace of God. Any fruit of the Spirit that we see in the world is purely the common grace of God in their life. Likewise, when we are saved, and when we are in our regenerate state, we are completely controlled, not by our passions and desires, we are controlled by God's passions and desires. We are. And any work of the flesh that we dabble in is simply a temporary dabbling in. It does not control us. The works of the flesh have primary control over the lost person, and the fruit of the Spirit has primary control over the saved person. The works of the flesh, this list, marks and identifies the lost person, and the fruit of the Spirit marks and identifies the saved person. I want to make sure they're not two equal lists. Four, this list is given as a warning. A warning. How do we know that? Look at verse 21. He says, I warn you as I warned you before. Paul gives this list as a warning to the church and to us. He gives it as a repeated warning. He said, look, I'm warning you now as I write this and I warned you before. There have been so many times in ministry where I have gone to talk to somebody and somebody pushed back on that and saying, I feel like you're giving me a warning. And I want to say, yes, yes, I'm warning you. The Bible is replete with warnings. Warnings aren't a bad thing. They're a loving thing, or they can be a loving thing. Paul gives a similar warning to the Corinthian church using the exact same words here in Galatians. He told the, the Corinthian church, I warn those who sinned before and all the others, and I warn them now that if I come again, I will not spare them. And then just three verses later, after that warning, Paul tells the church, church, examine yourself. Examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. Test yourself. Paul is saying here, listen, don't think that because you have the title of Christian that you're good. Don't think that because you bear the name of a Christian that you're fine. You have to repent of your sin. You can't claim to be a Christian and then live in works of the flesh. It doesn't work that way. And so Paul is lovingly warn, warning them, listen, you can say you're a Christian all day long, but if these things define your life, I'm warning you. And we'll get to that warning next week. All right? So hold off on that. So those are four theological foundations. Now we get to the works of the flesh. We're going to look at seven of them. All right? With each of the seven, I'm going to give you three things. Uh, number one, a definition so that we know what we're talking about. 
Two, where is it used in the New Testament? And then three, why is it a work of the flesh? Why is this a work of the flesh and not something else? Those, I'm going to give those with each of those. So let's start off with category number one. Three of them, sins of immorality, sexual immorality, impurity, and sensuality. Let's look at those individually. Sexual immorality. Definition. What is sexual immorality? Well, the Greek word is porneia. Porneia. It's where we get the word pornography from. The, uh, the Greek word for prostitute is porne. It comes from the same term. What is porneia? Porneia is unlawful sexual intercourse, prostitution, unchastity, or fornication. It's partic participation in prohibited degrees of marriage or fornication. It would include prostitution. It would include incest, homosexuality, bestiality, to give you a very shortened definition, what is porneia? Porneia is any sex or sexual acts whatsoever outside of God's institution of marriage. Make sure we understand that. I know sometimes couples, they date and they think, well, we're ha not having sex. You don't have to actually have sex to commit porneia. Where is it used in the New Testament? 25 times in the New Testament. The variants occur another 19 times. Jesus talks about it. Paul talks about it. John in Revelation talks about it. The sin in 1 Corinthians 5. Remember the man had his father's wife. It was called, a, it was called porneia. That was what the sin was. And you say, well, why is that a work of the flesh? Well, often, you know, I can't tell you how many times... Um, I remember my wife telling the story that she knew somebody who she said she wanted to wait until she got married to have sex. And they were like, well, that's nice. As a, like that was a, a, an archaic idea. But you, you surely you test drive the car before you buy it. So why is this a work of the flesh? Paul says... In 1 Corinthians, food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. Now that was a slogan. That was a slogan the Corinthians were saying. Listen, food is meant for the stomach. The stomach is meant for food. And Paul says, yes, and God will destroy them both. <laughs> the body is not meant for sexual immorality. In other words, you could see the Corinthians were saying, look, the body was meant for sex and sex was meant for the body. And Paul says, yes, but the body is not meant for porneia, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. Flee, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit with whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you are bought with a price. The reason that porneia is a work of the flesh is because we don't belong to ourselves. My body doesn't belong to me. It belongs to the Lord. Next, impurity. Definition of impurity. Literally, the word means any substance that is filthy or dirty. Refuse. That's, that's a very nice way of putting it. Figuratively, it means a state of moral corruption, immorality, vileness, especially of sexual sins. Where is it used in the New Testament? It's used 10 times in the New Testament. The variant of this word occurs another 32 times in the form of unclean. The majority of those are referring to unclean spirits. When you see the word unclean spirit, that word unclean is the variant of this word here for impurity. The term for impurity occurs in five of the list of vices. Five of the list of vices. 2 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4, Ephesians 5, Colossians 3, Galatians 5. Those are all on the screen for you. Now, why is it a work of the flesh? Why is this a work of the flesh? Paul writes, for God has not called us for impurity. Same word. God has called us to be in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God who gives the Holy Spirit to you. So he says, God has not called us to impurity. God has called us to holiness. Holiness is being set apart. It's kind of like marriage. 
When I got married to my wife and she got married to me, I set myself apart to her. Sorry, ladies, I'm off limits. Not that that, you're like, I know you are. I set myself apart for her. And she set herself apart for me. I will not share her with you. And she will not share me with you. Or anybody. Or the internet. Likewise, God says, I set you apart for me. You are mine. Sensuality. Definition. What is sensuality? Lack of self-constraint, which involves one in conduct that violates all bounds of what is socially acceptable. Self-abandonment. Other translations use the phrase debauchery, depravity, licentiousness, promiscuity. Uh, Where is that phrase used in the New Testament? It's used ten times in the New Testament. Jesus, Paul, Peter, they all talk about it. Peter references this. He says that the sensual conduct of Sodom and Gomorrah. Peter says that the conduct, what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah, was this term. Sensual conduct in Sodom and Gomorrah. Why is it a work of the flesh? We're really no different than the previous two reasons. But I'll give you one little other place it's used. Jude 4. And Jude 4, it says, Ungodly people who pervert the grace of God into sensuality. Same word. What Jude is saying there is that some people engage in sensuality and the reason they do that is because they abuse the grace of God. They turn the grace of God into cheap grace. That's what he means when he says they pervert the grace of God. It's kind of the idea, listen, I'm forgiven. There's grace. So it's okay if we sin. To live licentiously is to live as though grace is cheap. But, but grace is not cheap. We were bought with the price. We were bought with the precious blood of the Lamb of God. And that's why it's a work of the flesh, because grace is never cheap. It's free, but it's not cheap. Category two, sins of idolatry. Two of these, idolatry and sorcery. So let's start with idolatry. What is idolatry? Definition. The Greek word is idololatria, which is where we get the word idolatry from. We get it directly from the Greek. It's a hard word to define concisely. We have to do like a whole Friday series on that and try to define idolatry and how to identify that and know what that means. And, uh, but let me just give a concise definition. Anything receiving worship other than the, the one true God. Idolatry is anything receiving worship other than the one true God. Uh, Paul said, Paul equates covetousness with idolatry in Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3. He says covetousness is idolatry. Where is it used in the New Testament? This particular word for idolatry is only used four times in the New Testament. What, here's what's interesting about the word. There's only four things in the New Testament that we are told to flee from. Now, to be sure, we should flee from all sin. Let's be clear about that. But there's only four things that we are specifically told to flee from. Number one, sexual immorality. Remember Joseph, Potiphar's wife, he's ripping his clothes off. The dude runs out of the house butt naked. He's getting out of there. Two, love of money. Flee the love of money. Three, Youthful passions, which is probably the same thing as sexual immorality. And four, idolatry. Flee idolatry. Money, sex, idols. Unholy money, sex, idols. You don't have to flee money. Why is it a work of the flesh? Two reasons. Two reasons that idolatry is a work of the flesh. Number one, uh, idolatry is insanity and idolatry is adultery. Number one, idolatry is insanity. I I really want to go off on this rabbit trail, but I don't have time to. Uh, I'll just give a quick story from my boys. I was talking with them the other day about idolatry and about how crazy it would be. And it was a story in the Old Testament where they were worshiping a statue. 
and they were trying to understand like why do they worship statues and i was like i don't know and i was like it would be like imagine if there was an earthquake outside and it broke the sidewalk apart and then there was a piece of the sidewalk and then we set it up in our house and that but the earthquake's still going on and then we started praying to the sidewalk we're like oh sidewalk save us and they were like that's ridiculous i'm like i know like and they're like, why would you pray to a sidewalk? It's just a sidewalk. I'm like, exactly. That's what Jeremiah is saying to the people. And then one of my boys is like, but you made the sidewalk. Like, you poured the concrete. Why would you bow down to that which you made? I'm like, I know. Oh my gosh, my kids. Yeah, like, they get it. They get that idolatry is insanity. This is what Jeremiah says. Like, you, you've, you made the idol, you carved it out, and now you're bowing down to that which you made. Why would you do that? Idolatry is a work of the flesh because it is insane to worship an idol. Two, idolatry is a work of the flesh because it's adultery. In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul gives some strong warnings against idolatry. If you read 1 Corinthians 10, he gives these stories in the Old Testament where, uh, remember they made the golden calf in, in, in uh, um, Genesis 32, Exodus 32? Are you asking me to move? Dude, I'm preaching here. In Exodus 32, um, they made the golden calf and... They bowed down to it. And then as a result, God put to death 3,000 of them. Or he says that God killed 23,000 of them because of their sexual immorality. Or God sent serpents, and many of them were bitten and died. Or God sent his destroyer. And Paul goes down this list in 1 Corinthians 10. And then at the end of it, Paul says, listen, God didn't do all of that because he was angry. We often read the Old Testament and we think, man, God's so angry. No, Paul says, shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? God did these things because he was jealous. He's the only one who can be jealous and it be righteous. Holy. We have examples of that. Idolatry is uh, adultery against God. I could never, ever be okay with my wife sleeping with another man than God ever would be with sharing us with an idol. There is no circumstance I'm ever okay with that. Ever. And God is never okay sharing us. Ever. Ever. He loves us. He is so jealous for his glory and for us to see it and know it and treasure it. Next, sorcery. What is sorcery? Um, definition. Greek word is pharmakeia. That's where we get the word pharmacy. I don't know if there's any connection between pharmacy and sorcery. The use of magic, often involving drugs, the casting of spells upon people. This would involve everything today from horoscopes, seances, necromancy, which is communicating with the dead, psychics, fortune telling, real magic, not fake magic. I think there is such a thing as real magic. Some of that stuff you see on like America's Got Talent, that might be real magic. Seriously. There is real magic out there. The casting of spells, wearing of charms, Ouija boards, astrology. Where is this term used in the New Testament? Only used twice in the New Testament, here in Revelations 18. But the variant occurs in Revelations 9, 21, and 22. Now, why is sorcery a work of the flesh? Well, short answer and a long answer. The short answer, because it's an abomination. Deuteronomy 18. Anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens or a sorcerer or a charmer or a medium 
or a necromancer or one who inquires of the dead, whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. Now, that's the short answer. But you might say, well, but why? Why is it an abomination? And the longer answer is this. Sorcery is a work of the flesh ultimately because it seeks to know what only God knows. That's why. This is ultimately the same sin as in the garden. Remember the sin in the garden? God said, I have knowledge of good and evil. I know the difference between good and evil. And I don't want you to have that knowledge. Don't eat from the tree. You're not ready to handle this knowledge. Don't seek it. Don't desire it. Don't take it. I'm not ready to give you this knowledge. And they said, we want that knowledge. Give me that knowledge. And they eat. Sorcery is the same thing. Sorcery says, or God says, I have knowledge of the future. Or whatever. And God says, don't seek that knowledge. But we say, but I want to know. I want to know. And God says, you're not supposed to know. Last category today. Category four, sins of intemperance. Two of these, drunkenness and orgies. Drunkenness. What is drunkenness? Well, literally, drunkenness. That's all it means. It means to become drunk on alcoholic beverages. Uh, where's it using the New Testament? Three times in the New Testament. Uh, this term for drunkenness and the term for orgies, they occur side by side in all three places. So they only occur, both of the terms only occur three times. They both occur all back to back to back in all three uses. Romans 13, Galatians 5, and 1 Peter 4. But the variant is used another 12 times. Why is it a work of the flesh? Uh, there's many reasons why drunkenness is a work of the flesh. Many, many reasons. Uh, but let me give you one. Uh, it's from the mouth of Jesus. It's probably the best you know, if you ever want to in doubt, why is this wrong? Let's look to see what Jesus says. Jesus says, Luke 21, 34, but watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the cares of this life. And that day come upon you suddenly like a trap for it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the earth, but stay awake at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Uh, about two weeks ago, I was watching a 60 Minutes, or uh, no, a week ago. Yeah, a week ago. It was, it was either New Year's or right after New Year's. There wasn't 60 Minutes. And the theme of the 60 Minutes uh, show was eat, drink, and be merry. They had something about food, something about drinking, and something about being merry. I can't remember what the merry was. But they were, they were celebrating. They were like saying how, you know, new, it's New Year's. Let's eat, drink, and be merry. Now, realizing that that phrase ultimately comes from Scripture, and Scripture doesn't use it in like that good sense. Let's eat, drink, and be merry. No, Scripture says, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, and we're judged by God. Drunkenness weighs our hearts down. That's what Jesus says. It lowers our inhibitions, including spiritual ones. Both Jesus and Paul give an exhortation over and over and over again. They say things like, stay awake, keep alert, be sober-minded. Now that's primarily referring to the spiritual realm, not the physical. But the physical affects the spiritual. That's why people have asked me before, well, what about weed? Can we smoke weed now that it's legal? Well, yes, you can. It's not illegal to do it. But does it help you? Well, it makes my mind clear. Does it? Stay awake. Keep alert. Be sober-minded. Last one, orgies. I know you're all like, man, what's he going to do with this one? How's he going to handle this one? 
definition. I don't think orgy is a good translation. The, de- the, the, the definition of this word, drinking parties involving unrestrained indulgence and alcoholic beverages and accompanying immoral behavior, orgy, reveling, carousing. Most translations use the term carousing, and I think that's a better translation. I don't, this is not orgies as we necessarily think of them, all right? Carousing. This is like uh, the frat party, the sorority party, where people are just partying, drinking, having a good time. That's the idea. Where is it used in the New Testament? Three times in the New Testament. Same three as drunkenness. Why is it a work of the flesh? Why is carousing? A work? Paul says in Romans 13, 13, let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies or not in carousing and drunkenness. Now notice what he says there. Let us walk properly, meaning there is a proper way to walk as a Christian. Let me give a crass illustration. I, I'm a, I understand it's crass, okay? Let me give a crass illustration to make a point. Imagine if a husband and a wife were intimate in the middle of the day, in the middle of their living room, while their kids were watching. You would want to say, that's not proper. Go get a room. Go do that at nighttime after the kids are in bed. That belongs to the night. That belongs in privacy. It's not proper to do that in the light. Let me take that idea and reverse it. Paul says, you belong to the day. You belong to the light. It's not proper to walk in darkness it's not proper to walk in the way that the world walks live in the light we belong to the day walk properly in the light those are the seven works of the flesh we're looking at today now we're going to close on walking in the spirit how walking in the spirit enables us to not gratify the desires of the flesh Last week we had looked at, but I say walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. That's a promise. That's a beautiful, glorious promise that God has given us that if we walk by the Spirit, we will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So how does that work? I'm going to put these categories together. Number one, walking in the Spirit enables us to not gratify the desires of sexual immorality, impurity, and sensuality. How do we battle the temptation to look at internet pornography or TV pornography? You ever think about that? Every guy that I've I've met in my entire life at some point has asked that question, how do I win the war on pornography? How do I get past it? How do I defeat it? I've tried everything. I'm still failing. How do we battle the temptation to sleep with our boyfriend or girlfriend? I know how hard it is. I was dating too at one point. Or maybe not sleep with them, just get physical with them. How do we battle the temptation to get physical? How do we battle the temptation to not go to a strip club or a prostitute or get the magazine or the massage parlor where there's a, you know what I mean. How do you battle that? How do you not give in to that? We walk by the Spirit. We walk by the Spirit. We choose something greater than a 30-second sexual high. We choose something greater. But I say walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desire of sexual immorality and impurity and sensuality. 
And guys, this is not just a, a guy problem. There are girls who struggle with this as well. We walk by the Spirit, believing the promises of God. Kevin DeYoung, who's a pastor, writes in his book, In my experience, Matthew 5, 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, has been the most helpful verse in the Bible in battling temptation to lust. The key is that Jesus fights pleasure with pleasure. There's, that's the key to that paragraph. Pleasure with pleasure. We often try to fight pleasure with stoicism. You can't fight pleasure with stoicism. Or discipline. You can't fight it with that. You have to fight pleasure with pleasure. Sexual impurity can be pleasing in the moment, but Jesus promises a greater blessing for the pure of heart. They will see God. Years ago, there was a house in our neighborhood I often went past on my way to work. Frequently in the summer, a young lady in an immodest bathing suit would wash the car in the driveway. Matthew 5, 8 was the sword I used to slay my temptation, to turn my head and take a look. I thought to myself, I want to see God. I want to know God. I don't want to feel distant from Him for the rest of the day. I know that fellowship with God is better than a three-second glance. Amen? But I say walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desire of sexual immorality and impurity and sensuality. Second category, walking in the Spirit enables us to not gratify idolatry and sorcery. The temptation to idolatry is around us at every corner. Every tick of the clock. It's always there. It's there right now. It's there in the worship song that we're about to sing. It's there during the Lord's Supper. The temptation to be thinking about the score of the game, where we're going for lunch, whether the guy that I like is going to notice me today, it's always there. Always. Idolatry is, 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 is simply finding our joy in anything above God. And this temptation is always there. It's always there. Work, sports, entertainment, relationships, Friends, traveling, food, video games, approval, comfort, money, possessions, family. These are the idols we struggle with at CSBC. How do we win the battle? How do we find our joy in God more than these things? We walk by the Spirit. We walk by the Spirit. We sit down at the table of Psalm 1611. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. You sit down at the table of that and you eat. But I say walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desire of idolatry. <coughs> if we fill ourselves with the table of the world, we have no room left. It's like going to a buffet and then somebody inviting you to go like get more food, like another buffet. It's like, I can't eat a thing. Sorcery. I don't know how many of us are actively tempted with sorcery. Uh, but if you are, uh, uh, let me exhort you, stop. If, if, if you're doing horoscopes, stop. Horoscopes are not of, of God. I'm not going to make pull any punches with that. Fortune telling, stop. I'm pleading with you, put it down. 
Sorcery is ultimately idolatry because it's the idol of knowledge. It's the idol of knowledge. That's what sorcery is. It's the idol of knowledge. The idol of knowledge and power and control. The desire to know what God has said we don't need to know. We want God to spell everything out for us, and of course he doesn't. We get anxious. We get fearful. We want to know, and the question is, how do I fight that? How do I fight the the idol of knowledge, the idol of power, the idol of control, the idol of predictability? We walk by the Spirit. We walk by the Spirit, but I say walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desire of idolatry, the desire of sorcery, the desire to know what God has said you don't need to know. And last... Walking in the Spirit enables us to not gratify drunkenness and carousing. The great problem with drunkenness and parties, this is, this is the main problem. It's, it, it, it's not necessarily a problem because it costs a lot of money, it's dangerous, it's unhealthy, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a bad witness. Those are all problems. That's not, the, that's not the big problem with drunkenness and partying. Here's the big problem. The the great problem with drunkenness and parties is that a fountain of living water rises up and is offered to us and it says, here, come and drink from this and have fullness of joy in your souls. And we look at that fountain and we say, I'd rather drink from the tap. Let me have the tap. We've had a tough day at work, maybe a tough week, maybe a tough month. And to be honest, we want to forget about work. I know, guys, I used to drink all the time when I was lost. I I know how this works. Maybe our marriage is not going so well. We want to forget about our marriage. Maybe our relationship's not going so well. We want to forget about our relationship. Maybe we want to have a good time. You know, it's like, man, I don't want to forget about anything. I just want to have a good time. Maybe we're feeling guilty for some sin. People get drunk for many reasons. There's no one reason people get drunk. People get drunk for many reasons. And listen, even if you don't drink, don't, don't say, well, I, I don't drink, so that's the dumb fly. You don't have to drink alcohol to be drunk. You can be drunk on anything. You can be drunk on video games. Same problem. You can be drunk on entertainment. You can be drunk on Netflix. You can be drunk on work. You can be drunk on anything. So how do we resist that temptation? How do we resist the temptation to take our problems, to take our trials, to take our sorrows, to take our bad days and go and medicate it with alcohol? We walk by the Spirit. We walk by the Spirit. Guys, let me tell you, God offers you, God offers me something far more satisfying than a buzz or a good time. God offers us something far more satisfying than a good time. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. God says, come to my table. I've invited you over for dinner. Come to my table. There is fullness of joy where there are pleasures forevermore. And drink of the Holy Spirit. And drink and drink and drink and drink and drink of the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit until you are fully satisfied. You will be so satisfied by the Holy Spirit, you have no room left for what this world has to offer. But I say walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. This morning we're taking Lord's Supper. Um, 
Let me say with a sermon like this, it can be very easy to go into the Lord's Supper just thinking, yeah, I'm a failure. I've been doing that. Don't. Let me, I'm pleading you, don't do that. Go into the Lord's Supper saying, yes, I, I have been doing this. And I don't want to. I don't want to continue doing this. I want freedom. Help me, God, walk by your Spirit. And God will meet you there. 